So let's begin chapter 43, the immune system. Let's start with an overview. Pathogens are agents that cause disease and infect a wide range of animals, including humans. The immune system recognizes foreign bodies and responds with the production of enzyme cells and proteins that work together with our immune system. Now, all animals have an innate immunity, which is a defense that goes into motion immediately upon infection. While vertebrates, such as ourselves, have an adaptive immunity or what we call acquired immunity. Remember, vertebrates are animals with a vertebrae. So how does an animal's immune system recognize foreign cells such as this immune system cell here and this foreign cell? So all animals have an innate immunity. Innate immunity is present before any exposure to pathogens and is actually effective from the time of birth. When you think of innate immunity, you think of a broad range of pathogens that it responds to and not a specific pathogen. Now, adaptive immunity is also found in vertebrates only. Adaptive immunity, or what we call acquired immunity, develops over time after exposure to pathogens. The pathogens include toxins, any foreign substance or microbes such as a bacteria or a virus. So adaptive immunity helps the body or the immune system acquire immunity to any further attacks by the same pathogen. So adaptive immunity is a very specific response to a very specific pathogen. So figure 43.2 shows an overview of animal immunity. So in the gold box it shows the innate immunity and in the blue box it shows the adaptive or acquired immunity. So again, all animals have innate immunity. Mammals, fish, insects, all have innate immunities. Now innate immunity is the recognition of traits shared by a broad range of pathogens and uses a small set of receptors and is characterized by having a rapid response. So this makes up our first line of defenses, the barrier defenses like the skin, mucous membranes, and secretions. And this also includes internal defenses such as phagocytous cells, natural killer cells, antimicrobial proteins, and the inflammatory response. So the next line of defense, which you will only find in vertebrates, is our adaptive or acquired immunity. And this is characterized by having a slower response and is the recognition of a very specific pathogen which with a much larger array of receptors. And one thing that you need to be familiar with is that the adaptive immunity uses the humoral response. This is how antibodies defend against infection in body fluids. So humoral deals with the body fluids. And we are going to learn later that antibodies are acquired from prior infection or attacks. Now we also have what is called cell mediated response in our adaptive immunity. Um, this is different from humoral response in which the cytotoxins defend, cells defend against infection in cells that have actually succumbed to diseases, processes, or pathogens. And now the immune system has to deal with an infected cell as opposed to the humoral, which means the entire body. So our humoral system is when we have an infection throughout the body, when we are dealing with it before it has gone into the cells and causes damage in them. So let's get into 43.1 and learn about the innate immunity. And again, innate immunity is found in all animals and plants. In vertebrates, innate immunity is the first response to infection and also serves as the foundation for adaptive immunity. Now, invertebrates have immune systems to defend themselves from infection. In insects, an exoskeleton made of chitin, which is a long chain of glucose, forms the first barrier to pathogens. The digestive system is protected by the chitin-based barrier, and lysozymes, which are enzymes that break down bacterial walls, also help protect the digestive system. Now, hemocytes circulate within the hemolymphs or the fluids in the insect and carry out phagocytis. Phagocytis is the ingestion or digestion of foreign substances including bacteria which is extremely important for you to remember. 
So figure 43.3 shows phagocytosis. The cell attracts, is attracted to the pathogen via a surface receptor and engulfs the pathogen forming a vacuole which fuses with the lysosomes and the enzymes in the lysosomes will break down the microbe which then will be secreted by exocytus. Hemocytes are phagocytous in invertebrates. Hemocytes secrete antimicrobial peptides that disrupt the plasma membrane of fungus and bacteria. Figure 43 point show shows an innate immune response in an insect. Now the immune system recognizes bacteria and fungus by structures on their cell wall. And an immune response varies with the class of pathogens encountered. So figure 43.5 shows how the survival percentage changes as the different classes of pathogens are encountered. So now let's talk about the innate immunity of vertebrates. The immune system of mammals is the best understood of all the vertebrates. Innate defenses include barrier defenses, phagocytis, and antimicrobial peptides. Additional defenses that are unique to vertebrates include natural killer cells, interfons, and inflammatory responses. Now barrier defenses include skin and mucous membranes of the respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. Cells of mucous membrane produce mucus, which is a sticky fluid that traps and allows for the removal of microbes. Now this is saliva, tears, or mucus, which is made in our stomach or nose. Now the skin and mucous membranes are very difficult environment for the microbes to live in. The skin is because it creates a pH between 3.5, which is slightly acidic and difficult to colonize, so it can prevent the growth of many bacteria. So let's talk about cellular innate defenses. Once a pathogen has entered the body, it is subject to phagocytis. Remember, phagocytis is the ingestion and digestion of foreign substances, including bacteria. Phagocytis cells recognize groups of pathogen by toll-like receptors, or TLRs. So figure 43.6 shows the TLR signaling. A phagocytis cell recognizes the pathogens of lipopolysaccharide and flagellin. Lipopolysaccharide is a major component in bacterial cell walls, and flagellin are the proteins present in bacteria flagella. The pathogens are recognized by the TLR, or the toll-like receptors, and then they cause an innate immune response. Phagocytous cells are a type of white, white blood cell that engulf a microbe, which then fuses with a lysosome that will destroy the microbe. There are different types of phagocytous cells. Neutrophils engulf and destroy pathogens. Macrophagia cells are found throughout the body and they are the first white blood cells on the scene. Dendritic cells stimulate the development of the adaptive immunity and eosinophils discharge destructive enzymes. So as we continue to talk about cellular innate defenses, NK cells or natural killer cells are important to talk about. NK cells circulate through the blood and detect abnormal cells so, that, so they are looking for cells that have been infected by a virus or identified as cancer cells. So the bad or damaged cells that need to be killed will be targeted by the NK cells. The NK cells release chemicals leading to cell death through apoptosis. Now sometimes natural killer cells can go haywire and cause cell death of their own cells that are not infected such as an autoimmune as in autoimmune diseases. Now many cellular innate diseases involve the lymphatic system. And remember that innate defenses are present before any exposure to pathogens and are effective from the time of birth and go in motion immediately upon infection. So figure 43.7 shows the human lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is all the tubing and organs that make up the immune system, which include the lymph vessels and the lymphatic capillaries. And they are tied back and forth with the blood near the heart and at various organs. You also have the lymph nodes, which you may be able to fill in your neck when you are sick they enlarge because they are filling with fluids and making additional cells. 
Now one aspect of the lymph nodes is that there's three or more entry forms into the lymph node, which you can see here, okay? But there's few exit points which cause a traffic jam of fluid inside the lymph nodes, which slows the flow, and this gives ample time for the white blood cells in the lymph nodes to treat time to treat and attack any pathogens in the fluid. So again, there are many cellular innate defenses that involve the lymphatic system. Part of the innate system is the complement system. Peptides and proteins function in innate defense by attacking pathogens directly or impeding their reproduction. About 30 proteins make up the complement system, which causes lysis of invading cells by essentially tagging them or binding to their membranes and tagging them for destruction. It also helps trigger inflammation, which brings more fluid to the site of infection. One protein of the complement system is the inter interferon, which is, an imp which is important. The interferon proteins provide specific defenses against viruses and help play to activate macrophages. So let's talk about inflammation. The inflammatory response, such as pain and swelling, is brought about by molecules released upon injury of infection. When inflammation happens, additional fluids and cells are brought to the site of damage or infection to further defend oneself. It is triggered by the release of histamines from mast cells. So what happens is that the blood vessels dilate so they expand in size, bringing in more microphages. Remember, microphages are a type of phagocyte cells and are found throughout the body and are the first white blood cells on the scene. The activated microphage release cytokines, which then, which are signaling molecules that enhance the immune response. This also causes the capillaries to become permeable and allows fluids or gases to pass through it. So here are the major events in the inflammatory response. First, the skin gets cut, which allows the pathogen to enter and the injury site activates microphages and mast cells in the area that release chemical signals that cause the nearby capillaries to dilate and become more permeable. Next, fluid antimicrobial proteins and clotting agents move through the blood to the site and clotting begins. Then, the chemokines are released, which attract more phagocyte cells to the injury site from the blood. And last, and last, the neutrophils, the microphages, and the phagotysis pathogens and cell debris are at the site and the tissue begins to heal. Now pus is a fluid with, rich in white blood cells, dead pathogens, and cell debris from damaged cells. So it is the substance from the last step of the inflammatory response. Now some pathogens can dodge the mechanisms of the innate immune response. Some pathogens avoid destruction by modifying their surface to prevent recognition or by resisting breakdown by phagocytous cells. Now tuberculosis, for example, is a disease that can modify their surface to prevent recognition or it can resist the breakdown by the phagocytous cells. It kills millions of people a year and is very serious. So let's get into the adaptive immunity or what we call acquired immunity. Now remember that this is only present in vertebrates. Acquired immunity is the body's second major kind of defense and involves the activity of lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a type of white blood cells. There are two types of lymphocytes which both circulate through the, the blood. There's the T cells and the B cells. All lymphocytes arise from stem cells, however, where they mature differs. The T cells are lymphocytes that mature in the thymus above the heart, while the B cells are those that mature in the bone marrow. A trick to remember this is T for thymus and B for bone marrow. So lymphocytes are going to respond to antigens. Antigens are proteins on the surface of a pathogen that cause a response in B cells and T cells. When exposed to a pathogen, it activates B and T cells that have antigen receptors specific to the pathogen. Now, the lymphocytes don't recognize the full antigen. They recognize the tip of the antigen, which is called the epitope. So the full antigen doesn't get bound by proteins in the body. It just is the small region called the epitope. 
Now, epitopes can change or vary, and they are part they are the part that is recognized by the lymphocytes. So again, the antigen receptors of the lymphocytes bind to this small accessible part of the antigen, which is called the epitope. Now, here are the two types of, of lymphocytes found in the body called B cells and T cells, and remember they circulate throughout the blood. So once again, B cells and T cells have receptor proteins called antigen receptors that bind to foreign molecules called antigens. And each individual lymphocyte, lymphocyte is specialized to recognize a specific type of antigen. Both B cells and T cells have plasma membranes that have about 100,000 antigen receptors that all recognize the same epitope. So let's talk about the antigen receptors on B cells. Each B cell antigen receptor is a Y-shaped molecule with two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains. The, cons the constant region of the chains, called the C region, varies little among different B cells, whereas the variable region, called the V region, differs greatly between different B cells. The variable region provides the antigen specificity, which is the specific region that the will bind to the antigen. So here, figure 43.9 shows the structure of the B-cell antigen receptor. In the bottom left-hand corner, you can see a B-cell with a bunch of different antigen receptors sticking out of the B-cell. And these will recognize the specific antigen epitope. Now, the antigen receptor is a transmembrane protein. As you can see, it goes through the membrane of the cell. Now, this is the antigen binding site. The V represents the variable region or, and the C represents the constant region. Remember that the V region is going to vary from B cell to B cell while the C region is constant in every B cell. So inflammation can be either local or systematic, which means it happens throughout the body. For example, a fever is an inflammatory response triggered by pyrogens released by micro macrophages and toxins from pathogens, so it happens throughout the body. Also, septic shock is a metal condition that results from severe infection and septage, which is whole body inflammation. Se septic shock is a serious condition that occurs when an overwhelming infection leads to life-threatening low blood pressure. So binding of the B cell antigen receptor to the antigen is an early step in the B cell activation. This gives rise to the cells that secrete a solid form of a protein <clears throat> called an antibody or an immune glob globulin. Secreted antibodies are similar to B cell receptors, but they lack the transmembrane region that anchor the receptors into the plasma membrane. So here, figure 43.10 shows the antigen recognition by B cells and the antibodies. So here we can see the binding of the B cell antigen receptors to its antigen, which is the first step to activate the B cell. The B cell then secretes antibodies, which then have the ability to attach to the antigen of the pathogen. So let's talk about the antigen receptors on T cells. Now T cell receptors are different from the B cell receptors. Each T cell receptor consists of two different polypeptide chains called an alpha and a beta chain. The tips of the chain form a variable region or a V region like the B cells, and the rest is a constant or C region. Now the T cells and B cell antigen receptors are functionally different. So figure 43.11 shows the structure of the T cell antigen receptor. In the bottom left hand corner, you see a T cell with a bunch of receptors sticking out of the T-cell membrane. The T-cell receptors are also transmembrane receptors. Here you can see a constant region 
and a variable region in both the alpha and beta chains of the T cell receptor. Now, <clears throat> remember that the T cell has the same antigen receptors wrapped all the way around it as do all other T cells and as do B cells. So T cells work in a different way than B cells do. They still bind to small fragments of antigens, but they bind to fragments that are attached to infected cells. These antigen fragments are bound to surface proteins called MHC molecules on infected cells. The MHC molecules are host proteins that display the antigen fragment on the cell surface. So the host cell uses the MHCs to expose or bring forth the antigen fragments so that the cell can be identified. So in infected cells, such as a skin cell that has been infected by a virus or any, any antigen, has MHC molecules inside of it. And the MHC molecules will bind and transport the antigen fragment to the cell surface by a process called antigen presentation. Now the important part of doing this antigen presentation is the antigen fragments are now being shown on the surface of the cell to the immune system for identification and then removal. So then a T cell will bind to both an antigen fragment and the MHC molecule and this interaction is necessary for the T cell to participate in the adaptive immune response. So figure 43.12 shows the antigen recognition by T cells. Let's go ahead and talk about it and break it down. So here we can see a cell getting infected by a pathogen. And this cell has MHC molecules inside of it. The MHC molecules will bind to the antigen fragments and bring them to the cell surface by this antigen presentation. Now, the important part of doing this antigen presentation, again, is so that the antigen fragments are now being shown on the surface of the cell to the immune system so that it can be identified and removed. Now, the cell has then been tagged and a C cell can come and bind to both the antigen fragment and the MHC molecule. And this interaction is necessarily necessary for the T cell to participate in this adaptive immune response. Now this just shows a closer look at the antigen pre presenting complex. So the adaptive immune system has four major characteristics. They are the diversity of lymphocytes and their receptors, self-tolerance, which is the lack of reactivity against an animal's own molecules, B and T cells prolificate after activation, and the immunological memory. So let's briefly talk about each. Let's first talk about the diversity of lymphocytes and the receptors. By combining variable elements, the immune system assembles a diverse variety of antigen receptors. The immunoglobulin Ig gene encodes one chain of the B cell receptors. Many different chains can pre be produced from the same gene by the rearrangement of the DNA. Rearranged DNA is transcribed and translated and the antigen is formed. Here you can see the immunoglobulin gene encodes one chain of the B cell receptor in an undifferentiated B cell. Recombination rearranges the DNA producing a different chain. Rearranged DNA is transcribed and translated and the antigen receptor is formed. So this is how we can get all the diverse and different lymphocytes and the receptors from the same one chain.
Now let's talk about self-tolerance, which is the lack of reactivity against an animal's own molecules. Antigen receptors are generated by random rearrangement of DNA, which we just saw. As lymphocytes mature in bone marrow or the thymus, they are tested for self-reactivity. So you will run through this check to make sure that the receptors aren't going to bind to any of the own proteins and attack your own body. Now, sometimes this checking doesn't work and we get autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes or multiple sclerosis. Now, some B and T cells with receptors specific for our own body's molecules are destroyed by apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, or are rendered non-functional. The third major characteristic of the adaptive immune system is B and T cells proliferate or increase rapidly after activation. In the body, there are few lymphocytes with antigen receptors for any specific epitope. In the lymph nodes, an antigen is exposed to a steady stream of lymphocytes until a match is made. This binding of a mature lymphocyte to the antigen initiates events that activate the lymphocytes. Once activated, a B or T cell undergoes multiple cell divisions and makes a whole ton of itself. This prolification of lymphocytes is called chrysonal selection. Two types of clones are produced. Short-lived activated effector cells that act immediately against the antigen and long-lived memory cells that give rise to effector cells if the same antigen is en encountered again. So here in figure 43.14 shows the clonal selection of B cells. At the top you have three different B cells with different receptors. They all have different variable regions on the receptors so that makes their binding site different. The antigen will bind to the middle B receptor and will activate it and now we will clone this one or make a whole bunch of it. The clones will then mature into either plasma cells or memory cells. Plasma cells are the effector cells which will release the receptors or are the antibodies and the memory cells will remember the infection for next time. So let's take a look at our last major characteristic of the adaptive immune system, immunological memory. Immunological memory is responsible for long-term protection against diseases due to either prior infection or vaccination. The first exposure to a specific antigen represents the primary immune response. During this time, selected B and T cells give rise to their effective and memory forms. In the secondary immune response, memory cells facilitate a faster, more efficient response. So figure 43.15 shows the immunology memory of the adaptive immune system. We are first exposed to an antigen which will cause our body to create antibodies that are specific to that antigen. The antibodies will then peak and start to fall and that's when our infection will start to disappear. We will then be exposed to the antigen a second time and the antibody concentration will increase at a much rapid a much more rapidly rate and we will fight off the infection before we even know that we will we are sick the antibody concentration will then stay at a high concentration in order to make sure that we don't get sick again <clears throat> now if we are exposed to a different antigen at that time that antigen will have its own primary and secondary immune response to build antibodies. So let's get into concept 43.3. The acquired immunity has two branches, humoral immune response and cell mediated immune response. In humoral immune response, antibodies 
help neutralize or eliminate toxins and pathogens in the blood or lymph fluids. Humoral means fluids relating to the bodies, so it is the immune response in the body fluids. Then in cell-mediated immune response, specialized T cells destroy affected host cells. A type of T cell called a helper T cell triggers both the humoral and cell-mediated immune responses. Let's first talk about cell-mediated immune response. This is where specialized T cells destroy affected host cells. Signals from helper T cells initiate production of antibodies that neutralize pathogens and activate, activate T cells that kill infected cells. Now the infected cells that are attacked are known as antigen presenting cells. They are the antigen presenting cells because they have the class 1 and class 2 MHC molecules on their surface that present the antigen fragments. Now, class 2 MHC molecules are the basic basis upon which antigen presenting cells are recognized. Antigen receptors on the surface of the helper T cells bind to the antigens and to the class 2 MHC molecules and then signals are exchanged between the two cells. The helper T cell is activate and it proliferates and forms a clone of helper T cells which then will activate the appropriate B cells. When the helper T cell is activated, it secretes different cytokines that activate the appropriate B cells. So here, figure 43.16 shows the central role of the helper T cells in the humoral and cell-mediated immune responses. So here you see a microphagia cell or a dendritic cell engulf and break down a pathogen and then it displays the antigen fragments with a class 2 MHC molecule on the surface and it becomes known as an antigen presenting cell or an APC. The specific T helper cell will then bind to the, the displayed complex with the antigen receptor. This interaction promotes the secretion of cytokines by the microphagia and the T cell itself. The cytokines will then activate a B cell and the cytotoxic T cells to either go through the humoral immune response or the cell-mediated immune response. Cytotoxic T cells are the effector cells in the cell-mediated immune response. Remember, effector cells act immediately against the antigen by releasing the receptors called antibodies. The cytotoxic T cells recognize fragments of foreign proteins produced by infected cells, cancer cells, or transplanted tissues. The cytotoxic cells possess an accessory protein that binds to a class 1 MHC molecule on the effective infected body cell. The infected cytotoxic T cell secretes proteins that disrupt the membrane of target cells and trigger apoptosis. So here you can see the antigen fragment is bound to an MHC molecule on the infected cell which then is displayed on the surface and then a cytotoxic T cell can bind to the antigen fragment of the M MCH molecule. This leads to the activation of the cytotoxic T cell. The activated cytotoxic T cell then rele releases perforin molecules and protolytic enzymes called granzins. The prolin molecules form pores in the target cell membrane that allow various things to enter the cell, and the granzins enter the target cell by endocytus. The granzins initiate apoptosis within the target cells, leading to fragmentation of the nucleus and the release of small apoptotic 
apoptotic bodies and eventually the cell death. Once done, the released cytotoxic C cell can go and continue to attack other target cells. Let's talk about the humoral immune response where antibodies help neutralize or eliminate toxins and pathogens in the blood and lymph fluids. Now the humoral response is characterized by the secretion of antibodies by B cells. Activation of the humoral immune response involves B cells and helper T cells as well as proteins on the surface of pathogens. In response to an anti antigen and cytokines from helper T cells, a B cell proliferates and differentiates into memory B cells and effector cells, which are also called plasma cells, and these are the cells that will secrete the antibodies. So let's describe the activation of a B cell in the humoral immune response. So a microphagia engulfs and degrades a pathogen. It then displays a peptide antigen complex with a class 2 MHC molecule. The helper T that recognizes the displayed complex is activated with the aid of cytokines secreted from the microphagia forming a clone of the activated T cells which is not shown here. So here is an activated T cell that bears receptors for a specific antigen that is bound to a B cell. The B cells that have taken and degra degraded the same pathogen as the helper T cells will bind and this will activate the B cell. The activated B cell proliferates and differentiates into memory B cells and antibody secreting plasma cells. The secreted antibodies are specific for the same bacterial antigen that initiated the response. So let's talk about how antigens work to eliminate pathogens. Antibodies don't kill pathogens, instead they mark pathogens for destruction. There are different mechanisms of antigen disposal. First, in neutralization, antibodies bind to a viral surface protein preventing infection of a host cell. Antibodies may also bind to toxins in body fluids and prevent them from entering the body. Next, in optimization, antibodies bind to antigens on bacteria creating a target for microphagias or neutrophils which trigger phagocytosis. Lastly, in activation of a complement system in pore formation, antigen antibody complexes may bind to a complement protein which trigger a cascade of complement protein activation. Unfortunately, a membrane attack complex forms pores in the membrane of the foreign cell leading to lysis. So here in neutralization, we have a viral particle which has antigens. Now the antibodies are very specific for these antigens, so the variable region binds to the antigen and neutralizes it. Now this is extremely important in viruses because viruses use antigens to dock to the cell surface proteins and then trigger the host to allow the entire viral protein into the host. or to allow the injection of the viral DNA into the host. And because the antibodies are bound to the antigen, this virus is now prevented from binding to the host cell. So here in optimization, you have a viral particle with attached antibodies floating in the bloodstream, and then the microphagia and the neutral fills, which are other phagocytic cells consume the entire thing and take it apart. And lastly, in the activation of a complement system and pore formation, the antibodies that are bound to the antigen recruit complement proteins to the cell targeting them for destruction, which then cause the formation of pores and then apoptosis. So you know that antibodies can recruit complement protein systems that can trigger cell death. 
So there are five different forms or classes of immunoglobulins that can be expressed in B cells that have similar antigen binding specificity, but different heavy chain C regions and different functions. Both the humoral and C cell mediated responses can include a primary and secondary immune response. Memory cells enable the secondary immune response. So active immunity develops in direct response to a pathogen, and it can be a direct response to a vaccination. So your body sees the pathogen and builds up a response to kill off the pathogen. Now, immunization is when a non-pathogenic form of a microbe or part of a microbe causes immune, an immune response. Now, passive immunity is when you are not exposed directly to the pathogen itself, but you are getting the benefits of it. For example, you get antibodies naturally when the immunoglobin G crosses the placenta from the mother to the fetus, and also when the immunoglobulin A passes from the mother to the infant in breast milk. It can be artificially, it can be, it can be also given artificially by injecting antibodies into a non-immune person or somebody that doesn't carry certain antibodies for a certain disease. So you can inject antibodies to help get rid of an infection, but this is short-lived because antibodies will disappear and the person does not have the ability to make any more. So here, figure 43.20 is an overview of the adaptive immune response, and it shows everything together, both the humoral and the cell-mediated response. This will be extremely important for you to know this type of diagram. So antibody specificity and antigen antibody binding has been used in research, diagnostic, and therapy. Polychromial antibodies, which are produced following exposure to a microantigen, are products of many different clones of plasma cells which are each specific for a different epitope. Now, monoclonal antibodies are prepared from a single clone of B cells grown in a culture. So let's briefly talk about immune rejection. Cells transferred from one person to another can be attacked by a person's own immune defenses. This causes complications in blood transfusion or the transplant of tissues or organs. So you have a certain blood type and the blood type is determined by the proteins present on your red blood cells or the antigens present on the surface. The antigens of red blood cells determine whether a person has a blood type A, B, AB, or O. A person with A has a antigens, a person with B has B antigens, and a AB person has both A and B antigens. Now a person with O has neither antigens. Now antibodies to non-self blood types exist in the body. So transfusion with an incompatible blood leads to the destruction of the transfusion used blood cells by the antibodies in one's own body. So if the wrong blood is transfused, it can be fatal. Now transplanted tissues can also have complications. Transplanted tissues have MHC molecules that are different among different individuals and can be viewed as non-self and the tissue cells can then be attacked by one's own immune defenses. So if the donor and recipient's MHC tissue types are well matched, then the chances for a successful transplant increase. Now people who have had transplanted tissues or organ transplants are on auto-suppressant medication to slow or block the functioning of the immune system. So that's why people with transplanted tissues 
can die of simple common infections. So some pathogens have evolved to decrease the effectiveness of the host immune response. Now, if the delicate balance of the immune system is disrupted, it can lead to an, the effect of a range from minor to sometimes fatal events. Allergies are exaggerated hyposensitive responses to antigens called allergens. In localized allergies, such as hay fever or a bee sting, Antiglobulin E antibodies are produced after first exposure to an antigen and attached to the receptors of, on mast cells. Then the next time the allergen enters the body, it binds to the mast cells associated with the immunoglobin E molecules. The mast cells release histamines, which cause inflammation which cause vascular changes leading to the typical allergy symptoms. <clears throat> An acute allergic response can lead to anaphylactic shock, which is a life-threatening reaction that happens within seconds of an antigen, an allergen exposure. So immunoglobin E antibodies are produced after first exposure to an antigen. The antibodies attach their to receptors on mast cells. Then the next time the an allergen enters the body, it binds to the mast cells asso associated with the immunoglobin E molecules. The mast cells then release tons of histamine, which cause inflammation, which then will lead to vascular changes and cause the typical allergy symptoms. In individuals with autoimmune diseases, the immune system loses tolerance for itself and turns against certain molecules of the body. Autoimmune diseases include systematic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, insulin-dependent diabetes, and multiple, multiple sclerosis. Here in figure 43.23 shows an x-ray of the hands that are deformed by rheumatoid arthritis. Now modern exercise has helped improve immune system function. While psychological stress has been shown to disrupt immune system regulation by altering interaction of humoral, nervous, and immune systems. Also, significant rest is important for the immunity. Inborn immunodeficiency results from hereditary or developmental defects that prevent proper functioning of innate humoral or cell-mediated defenses. Acquired immunodeficiency develops later in life and results from exposure to chemicals and biological agents. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is caused by a virus. So pathogens have evolved mechanisms to prevent immune, as in antigenic variation. Through antigenic variation, some pathogens are able to change the epitope expression and prevent recognition. For example, the human influenza virus mutates rapidly and the new flu vaccinations must be made each year. Human viruses occasionally exchange genes with the viruses of domesticated animals. This poses a danger as human immune systems are unable to recognize new viral strands. Some viruses can maintain in a host in an inactive state called latency. For example, herpes simple viruses can be present in human hosts without causing now, AIDS is when you are very low in your white blood cell count, specifically helper T cells. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, infects helper T cells. So when the virus causes the lice of helper T cells, this impairs both the humoral and cell-mediated immune responses because, remember, the helper T cells are communicators between the T cells and the B cells. This will then lead to AIDS 
which is the full-blown disease which leads to death from a common cold or flu, something simple since it cannot be recognized and counteracted. So figure 43.25 shows the progress of an untreated HIV infection. As you see, as the HIV concentration virus increases, our, it destroys more helper T cells to eventually we get full-blown AIDS where we no longer can fight any infection and, we and the people die of a common cold or a simple infection. So once again, people with AIDS are very skeptical to opportunic infections and cancers that take advantage of the immune system in a time of collapse. The spread of HIV is a worldwide problem. The best approach for slowing this spread is education about practices and the transmission of viruses. A frequency to certain cancers increases when the adaptive immunity is impaired. 20% of all human cancers involve viruses. The immune system can act as a defense against viruses that cause cancer and cancer cells that harbor viruses. 